Hey there, I thought I'd do a video. I'm recording this video on the 3rd of November, which is, as it turns out, the Feast of St. Richard Hooker. I mean, the commemoration of Richard Hooker in Anglican calendars. I'm not going to post it till tomorrow, though, um, November 4th, the centenary of the discovery of King Tut's tomb, because I already wrote a blog post today, and I don't actually do that much videoing or blogging, so I try to not cram them all into one day just because I had the time to do them all in one day. So anyway, because today is the commemoration of Richard Hooker, I thought it was worth making a little video, a little bit about Richard Hooker, even though I'm really an actually truth, an actual truth, I'm a late antiquity guy. Um, that's really what I did a PhD on and what I have spent most of my academic career actually working on and writing about. Nonetheless, I am, as it turns out, an Anglican, and Richard Hooker is often held up as being, like, the great Anglican theologian. He's the guy who set us forth on our journey um, as Anglicans. And one of the things that he is often said uh, to having done is that he helped chart this uniquely, or if not uniquely, typically, Anglican um, via media, this middle way between Roman Catholicism and Puritanism, or some, some people might actually say Protestantism, on the other hand, or the Reformed faith, on the other hand. And the fact of the matter is, depending on how you read Richard Hooker and the early Anglican, Anglican tradition, you're right. But he wouldn't have said he was doing that. It's true. Richard Hooker would have said he was just doing Protestantism. He was doing Church of England, C of E, Reformed Catholic faith. That's what he would have said, and that's what he did, basically. Because the thing is, the nature of uh, the English Reformation, as carried out at sort of its official level, was actually uh, meant to be something that, rather than being a via media, was meant to actually be have what is called comprehension. That the desire is to... Um, articulate perhaps more clearly some things that were underdetermined in the late medieval tradition, such as justification by faith, which actually has a Roman Catholic articulation at the Council of Trent in the 16th century. After the Reformation gets rolling, they come up with their own way to talk about how we are justified by faith and uh, justified by grace and how works aren't part of that. But they also have their own, it's still incompatible with what Luther and the Reformation teach, but this is underdetermined before Luther sort of gets the ball rolling on that question. And so then, on the matter of justification by faith, we would say that the um, Church of England falls within the Protestant camp with the Reformed and the Lutherans. Not being a guy who does 16th century stuff, I'm not actually going to go there to talk about the distinctions between perhaps how the Reformed so-called Calvinists and the Lutherans um, may or may not be the same or different, and whether or not which camp Richard Hooker falls into. I'm not that guy. I'm your late antique guy. So you're probably thinking, then why on earth are you doing a video about that which you know not? Well, I don't know. No, okay, so anyway, the real thing that I want to say though is that comprehension ends up creating something that looks like the Via Media, basically. That um, the principles of the Articles of Religion, including Article 24, are that we Scripture contains everything that is sufficient unto salvation. If there is something from tradition that is not repugnant to the word of God, um, if there is something in the tradition that um, is not, yeah, even if it can't be proved from, from Scripture, it can still be believed. And sometimes, in fact, the Anglican tradition has held onto um, certain things from the deposit of faith that we believe are consistent with reformational um, Protestantism, consistent with the Protestant tradition as it is forging itself um, in the years following 1517, which, of course, we just commemorated on Reformation Day on Halloween, October 31st. So, all of that to say, because the Church of England ends up holding on to things such as the historic episcopate, such as um, a liturgy that is, um, although it does include, include some innovations from people like Martin Butcher, Butzer, I don't know how to pronounce it. It looks like Bucher to me, um, as well as some Cranmerian things. It is, for the most part, actually just a reformed Catholic liturgy. It is the Roman Rite, according to the use of Sarum, translated into English with some tweaks here and there, removing things that are not compatible with Protestant faith, and adding a few things here and there in the wording um, to make it 
um, more Protestant. That is actually what the Book of Common Prayer, for the vast majority of what goes on in it, that's what it is. So, um, so we kept that. We kept the historic Epis episcopate at the beginning. We kept most of the canon law of the medieval church, and we kept reading the apocrypha. Pretty crazy, I know. Um, didn't keep the pope. Didn't keep the pope. And in the liturgy, also kept, you know, some of the vestments, but not all of the vestments. So there was like a trade-off. Um, a lot of things are adiaphora, um, but the Anglican Church believed if it is totally adiaphora, um, there was nevertheless, as it forges its identity over the decades um, up to the Civil War and then the restoration of the monarchy, the identity that is forged that we think of as being Anglicanism up to the point when the Puritans are purged, um, it is something that maintains a strong connection with the fathers, consciously a connection with the fathers and the best of the medieval divines, but that is not also afraid to um, turn to scripture and um, using our reason to interpret scripture where we believe that perhaps some of the fathers and medieval divines and indeed the Roman tradition itself have erred. And so we take this deposit of the Catholic faith and bring it forward and pass it on to future generations in a language such as the people understandeth. So this is what's going on. And this is Richard Hooker actually does help do this. What Richard Hooker d helps do is present um, the fathers, present human reason and present scriptural support for a lot of things that Pearson said Yo, Church of England shouldn't be doing these things, guys. We got to get rid of them. Uh, and he says, well, no, actually, here are the reasons why um, in the laws of ecclesiastical quality, these are the reasons why we are going to um, continue doing what we do. And he also has a really great learned discourse of justification um, on which I wrote in at Fontes Journal back in 2020, which I recommend you read my article. I also recommend you read it if you're like late 16th century prose isn't really your thing. You can actually read um, from Davenant Press, there is a modernization of the learned discourse, um, which Richard Hooker has been accused, even in his own lifetime, of being a bit difficult to read. He's like the Cicero of the English Reformation. Anyway, so Richard Hooker, we're stoked about Richard Hooker. But I'm a late antique guy, so let me talk a bit about how Richard Hooker interacts with what I do. My main research as has been published um, in like academic presses, journals, book, is about Pope St. Leo the Great and about the Council of Chalcedon and its aftermath. That's like my main academic thing. So how does Richard Hooker interact with him? Well, there's gonna be more about this coming out, coming out from me soon. So I'm just gonna give you a little sample um, specifically about the Council of Chalcedon. Now the Council of Chalcedon is this big church council. It's the fourth ecumenical council. Um, convened in the year 451 by the Emperor Marcion, met in the city of Chalcedon, which is across the Bosporus from Constantinople, where the Eastern Emperor himself would have lived. And um, at Chalcedon was hammered out a Christological formula, a definition of the faith, um, that was used to help clarify all of the matters that had been uh, arising and dis being discussed in various polemics since the year 428 with the accession of Nestorius, as Bishop of Constantinople, Nestorius himself taught that there were two persons. Hold the phone. What? So he taught that there were two prosopa in um, in Christ, not simply two fuses, two natures. And that these um, <laughs> had a conjunction, a synothea, um, in the hypostasis of Christ. There's a divine one and a human one, because what he's trying to do is do justice to the fullness of the humanity and divinity of Christ. But what Nestorius fails to do is be clear about how fully united they are. Um, and when people point this out to him, in good, strong, late antique Episcopal fashion, he doubles down. And whereas this strategy works long run for someone like Athanasius or Cyril of Alexandria, it is rarely something that works well for the Bishop of Constantinople. And so he doubles down and basically gets himself kicked out. But stuff keeps running around. And we don't really need to get into too many of the details about this. Although I think Chalcedonian Christology is super important. And um, I'm going to read you what they come up with. And then I'll talk a bit about the history of that. And then we're going to look a little bit at Richard Hooker. So here we go. I have for you here the definition of the faith. 
Um, this is my own translation, um, translated by the Greek text printed by uh, Drobner in his book, The Fathers of the Church. Pages 487 to 88, because you always need a bibliography when an academic is talking. And so, following the Holy Fathers, we all, with one voice, teach to confess the one and same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. The same perfect in divinity and the same perfect in humanity. The same truly God and truly man, anthropos, human, of a reasoning soul and a body, of one substance with the Father according to the divinity, that's Nicaea right there, and the same of one substance with us according to the humanity, double consubstantiality, it's a big deal. Through all things like us except for sin, that's in the Bible, begotten before the ages from the Father, also in the Bible, according to the divinity, and in the last days, the same for us and for our salvation from Mary the Virgin, Theotokos, or God-bearer, also in the Bible, according to the humanity. This is all in the Bible, as it turns out. One and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten. Let me say, that is an anti-Gnostic statement, even if they don't mean it to be. Understood in two natures, she says, naturae in the Latin translation, well, nat duabus naturis, um, without confusion, these are these are the important Chalcedonian um, negations. There are these adverbs. So, the two natures of Christ are joined and knit together without confusion, without change, without division, without separation, which is not exactly the same um, as division, with the difference of the natures at no point removed through the union, but rather the property of each nature preserved and coming together into a single person, which is a prosopon here, and a single subsistence, which is a hypostasis, yes, um, not dispersed or divided into two persons, in this case prosopa, two prosopa, but one and the same son, only begotten, God, word, the Lord Jesus Christ, just as the prophets beforehand and he, our Lord Jesus Christ, taught about himself, and as the creed of our fathers teaches. Creed symbolon, there's things to be said about that word. Creed of our fathers, meaning the Nicene Creed, which they actually, uh, is actually at the very beginning, is a long statement. That's like the part that we always quote in our little, like, handbooks of theology and stuff. That's the part we quote. But if you read the Acta of Chalcedon, which I don't actually think most of you should. It's like three volumes of bishops talking at each other. Um, but if you read the full Acta, you'll see that the entire statement actually says that we confess along with the 318 Holy Fathers, which is the guys who were assembled at Nicaea, and then they go after this big long thing. They actually include the entire Nicene Creed in the Chalcedonian definition. So that is, and that is standard Orthodox Christology for the entire, not the entire church, because they're cops and Syrian Orthodox of Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic Christians from 451, who obviously there's no Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic, but like up to the Reformation, and most of the Re Reformation churches embrace the teaching of Chalcedon, and there are some really amazing things that I wanted to mention uh, that I don't have time for because we're supposed to be talking about Richard Hooker on his uh, commemoration, but there's some really interesting things that go on in the 6th century with um, the Emperor Justinian and his theology, Leontius of Byzantium and his theology, um, in which I think you can find being sung by St. Romanos the Melodist and his his hymns, he's a hymnographer, as, and pushing right on through um, into the 7th century with St. Maximus the Confessor, who for many people today, he's having a bit of a resurgence at Renaissance. He's almost seen some, of, some feel like he's like a high point. He's a, he's a high point in Christology. So, so this is Chalcedon. It is core, it is central, it is in fact the artic the uh, interpretation of this document that I've just read out loud and of the tome of St. Leo the Great is the, pro is the business of two further ecumenical councils as they try to elucidate it and try to reconcile people such as the Coptic Orthodox to the Imperial Church. So, so Richard Hooker, it turns out, um, Chalcedonian Christology was part of the necessary apparatus of our sanctification and union with God, um, according to Richard Hooker, which I think is beautiful. Um, 
because one of the theological results of the explication and elaboration of Chalcedonian Christology is the adoption um, within Chalcedonian circles. So we're talking the Latin West, Greek East, um, the Orthodox within uh, the Syriac world um, who embrace Chalcedon. Um, we, we also embrace St. Cyril of Alexandria's concept of the communicatio idiomatum, the communication of idioms or traits uh, that goes on between the human and the divine in the single person of Christ, such that what can be said of Christ as God can also be said of Christ as man. And what that means um, is that we can say that one of the most holy trinity was crucified and died for us. Bam! That's what St. Cyril gets you. St. Cyril's on fire. I love St. Cyril. I love St. Leo. I love Richard Hooker. I'm an Anglican. So, so that's like, that's part of it, right? Oh, you can also, of course, say, um, so one of the, the most holy trinity was crucified and died for us. Um, you also also say that uh, Jesus of Nazareth created the universe, which is also mind-blowing. Um, but yeah, so that's it. And uh, Richard Hooker, himself makes a clear articulation of the doctrine of the communicatio idiomatum in the laws of ecclesiastical polity book five chapter 53.3 i forgot to grab my copy of the laws off the bookshelf i'm just reading from some notes on my screen so i won't read that passage for you here on the commemoration of saint richard hooker so here's an out working of chalcedonian christology though and this is what i'm continue to think about because I am also, I dig monks. My, like, I have like one monk article that's about Christology. I have a second monk article about demons coming out sometime soon, at which point my um, academic career will burgeon and blossom into something beyond Leo the Great and Christology. Um, I love monks. I'm teaching the Desert Fathers right now as well. And monks are against Nestorianism. I would say that the ism of Nestorius, probably even those um, in the Church of the East who are, you know, embrace after the six six hundreds um when the church of the east officially embraces the teaching of nestorius i think that these dudes uh themselves would actually reject the ism associated with nestorius um but there's some prominent monks who are against nestorius and i'm going to be talking about them on december 22nd uh john cassian who is super super fun um mark the monk who i love him deeply his shenudi who's a good time um they're all against nestorius and so that's an exploration I have to get into. Um, but the thing is, it's because Nestorianism um, undermines spiritual theology. Because an outworking of Chalcedonian Christology in these guys, including in Richard Hooker, is that we are able to be united to God, the Holy Trinity, specifically through the human nature of Christ. Right? This, and this is it. that We ascend to the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit. Um, this is Trinitarian, and this is basic Trinitarian theology, but that means that um, when Trinitarian theology starts impinging upon Christology, how do we think about who Jesus is? How do we come to the Father who we worship and love and adore and want to know for eternity? How does this work? It works because God himself took on flesh. It works because God came, became one of us, taking on all the stuff that is ours, and he not just, he didn't just heal it, although he did. He didn't just take away the penalty for our sin, although he did. He also gathers us up into the Trinitarian life, specifically through the vehicle of being completely human with a full human nature, with human soul, human body. Um, and so, this is your great Richard Hooker quote. I've spent probably about as much time talking about late antique Christology as about Richard Hooker here today. Late antique bros are going to bro. But here we go, Richard Hooker, Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity, Book 5, Chapter 50, Section 3. I love it. Okay, here we go. Christ is whole with the whole church and whole with every part of the church. As touching his person, which can no way divide itself or be possessed by degrees and portions. Oh, right there, right there. The fullness of Christ is available to you, Christian. You are baptized into Christ and you get the totus Christus. Also, you go to church. This is Augustine. Church is Christ, the body of Christ, right? 
Back to Hooker. But the participation of Christ imports, besides the presence of Christ's person, and besides the mystical union thereof with the parts and members of his whole church. Whoa, hold the phone. Sounds like divine participation to me. What is this, theosis? I don't know. I don't actually do the 16th century, so I, I don't want to get anyone mad at me. Nevertheless, sounds like it to me. So besides the mystical union, he actually says copulation, which is, makes you chuckle in the 21st century. And besides the mystical union thereof with the parts and members of his whole church, a true actual influence of grace, whereby the life which we live according to godliness is his. And from him we receive those perfections wherein our eternal happiness consists. Now let me tell you, I don't know much about scholastic theology, but I do know a bit about Maximus right there. Thus, we participate Christ partly by imputation, as when those things which he did and suffered for us are imputed unto us for righteousness, right? That's justification by faith. That's the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith. Partly by habitual and real infusion, as when grace is inwardly bestowed while we are on earth, and afterwards more fully both our souls and bodies be made like unto his in glory. That's Epictasis. That's St. Gregory of Nyssa right there, folks. Mic drop from Richard Hooker. You can become holy. And you are able to become holy because God himself united the fullness of a perfect human nature to himself in our Lord Jesus Christ. Place your faith on him. Receive the sacrament. Read his word. Seek holiness. And he will empower you to do all those things because you're already participating in the divine life by the grace of your baptism, happy commemoration of the feast of Richard Hooker.